Uh, good morning, everyone. My name's Hugh McKee. I'm a developer advocate at Lightbend. And this talk is uh, kind of a long title, but it's seven reasons why your microservices should use event sourcing and CQRS. So um, in the talk, I'm going to be uh, really focusing on the, the, on the data side. And I, it was hard to pick seven reasons, and, and I just picked the number seven because um, I thought it might be an interesting title. Uh, but there's way more reasons than seven for, for using this, or maybe not using event sourcing and CQRS. But I thought I'd try and pick some ones that weren't the ones that I saw all the time in literature and documentation or things that I, you know, blogs and stuff that you read about event sourcing and CQRS. So hopefully uh, you'll find these seven reasons interesting. The, um, but most talks, when they start, about, start up about um, you know, going to microservices, and we've been talking about microservices for years now, um, but it's usually we're talking about taking a large and complex system of monolithic applications and replacing it with the large and complex systems of finer grain microservices. So the idea is that we're trying to uh, decompose systems into smaller components. And often the, the focus is on the code but not necessarily a lot of focus on the data. So in this talk, we're going to be focusing a lot on, on the data. Because you know, there's the processing part of our systems, but there's also the persistence part of our systems. And the, I think it, there's a lot of um, interesting characteristics of, of the persistence part of the things that are, people are doing with microservices related to not just breaking up the code, but breaking up the data as well. Because, and that's what it is. I mean, we're, what we're talking about is basically just splitting things apart, right? So when we do microservices, we're, you, know, we, you, know, you often hear of taking a big old monolith and splitting it apart into smaller microservices. Uh, another term I've been hearing lately is just it's a different form of modularization. You, know, you, you, know, you have, say, a, a monolith could be more manageable, is, is the argument, if it was better modularized. Well, in the case of going to microservices, you're kind of have enforced modularization where you're, you're breaking things apart physically uh, into different deployable code units. But the same thing can go with your data. So part, one of the goals of going with a microservice system, and there's a lot of goals, but one of them is that you want to build a, a system of loosely coupled services. And the reason for loosely coupled is that we want to be able to do things faster. So if, you know, the, the, the traditional thing is if you have a monolith, you have some deployment cycle, and you got to get agreement from everybody, all right, everything's ready, we're good, we've done all our testing, let's deploy it to production. It's kind of a, you know, it's a bigger effort because maybe there's multiple teams involved in doing it. The idea is if when you're going to microservices that you have services that are themselves are independently deployable. So when I talk to people, and you know, it's fun, you, you talk to people like in your own organization or in conferences or whatever, and, and you, you, maybe the topic of uh, microservices come up, and you ask, all right, well, what, what kind of microservices are you doing? I, I kind of use these three questions here as characteristics. These aren't rules or anything like that, but it's just, I'm just trying to get a feel for what kind of flavor of microservice are you doing. So this is kind of the easy one. It's independently deployable. You know, so you've broken up the code. But the next one is a little bit harder, and this is where the wheels often come off the apple cart, where you say the microservice owns its own schema. So the idea here is that, say, if you and I are on a team and we're, we're responsible for a microservice, we also own the responsibility for the, for the schema itself. Often what happens, and there's nothing wrong with this, but often what happens is that you have a, a, a legacy database and there's no way you're going to get permission to break up that database. You might get permission to break up the code, but often it's harder. That's a much harder battle to break up the database. If that's the case, so be it. But you're making a compromise. You, you, know, you have a, a level of coupling at the database level. You know, so if you really want loosely coupled services, the, the goal is just trying to get things loosely coupled not only to code, but at the data level. And then finally, a kind of a third question that I ask is, the only way that anybody gets to see your data is if they go through your API. So there's no backdooring. Uh, you know, so say you have a microservice, you have your own data, and nobody knows what that data looks like except through, the, through your APIs. And the reason for this, again, is loosely coupling, because if you need to make changes to your data, it's, 
your microservice should be a black box as much as possible. That's loosely coupling, which gives you the freedom to make changes inside the microservice without having to get permission from everybody else to get agreement. When you have to go into meetings and talk to people and get agreement and, and everything, then that's friction. It's slowing you down. It's, it's, it's uh, not giving you that velocity of trying to do things quickly. So it, it's just, you know, again, these, are, these aren't rules. It's just kind of, you know, get an idea of what kind of microservice you have. The goal, though, is try and get it as loosely coupled as possible. But often when, uh, depends on who you're talking to, but when you start talking about splitting things apart, it's, you know, it's like, it's like one thing if you talk to somebody and say, okay, I'm going to split apart the code. And they go, okay, that's, I, can, I can deal with that. But then you say, I'm going to split apart the database. It's like, you know, and it's like, what are you, nuts? You know, it's like, you know, are you, are you crazy? This is, this is not going to happen. You know, we have DBA teams. We have formal processes, blah, 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 blah. And, but you're missing out, I think. And, and this is why I wanted to kind of do this talk to just kind of show you some of the advantages of using some of these alternate approaches. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to kind of walk through the seven reasons. But the first one I wanted to do is... Uh, just show you uh, what is event sourcing in CQRS. So here's a diagram that I'd like to just walk through real quick to kind of give you an idea. If you haven't seen this before, I know the first time I heard a talk, and it was a Lightman talk, and this was like three years ago or something like that, and uh, the, it was a webinar, and the speaker said CQRS, and it's like, I, all of a sudden I went, oh man, another acronym, what the heck is CQRS? You know, so it's Command Query Responsibility Segregation. And it's a kind of a fancy term, but basically it's splitting the reads, reading, the writing and the reading apart. So this is, the kind, this is the basic flow. You have a service, and say a client sends in a request to the service, and say this request is to do some kind of change. You know, you want to change some data, right? Some kind of state change. And the, for that, that kind of request, is, it's thought of as a command. And a command is an intent to do something, like add an item to an order. You know, add the shipping address, add the billing address. You know, here's a deposit for my bank account. That's an intent. It, it hasn't happened yet, but it's a request. So these things are handled on kind of what's called the right side, because on the right side is where we're going to make changes to the state of, say, an entity of some kind. So this command comes in, and it's validated. It, you know, does it, is the command OK? Does it violate any business rules? Or whatever it takes to make sure that this is a command that's good to, to be done by this service, then what's emitted is one or more events. And an event is a historical fact. You know, it's usually time stamped. This, we added this item to, to this shopping cart at this time. Done, right? The, the interesting thing starts, so is how it's persisted. So the event itself is persisted. We're not updating something. We're not, say, changing, you know, modifying the order, in, you know, say, in case we're doing an order. We're just recording the fact that we added an item to the order, add another item to the order, adjust the quantity. Each one of these things is an event that's going into this event store. So this event store is a real simple data structure. It's like a key value. You know, it's like entity ID, timestamp, sequence number, or something like that, but real, real simple data structure. The idea is that to get the current state of the entity, it's just a matter of running through all the events to get you know, uh, all, the, all the data running through each event gives you the current state of the order. But it, it's also the, the, the event store is um, you don't change it. You're, all we're doing is in, inserting. So say you remove an item from the cart. So there's an event. I remove the item from the cart. That gets, logged, that gets stored in the, in the database. What's kind of interesting here, just real quick, is that um, I've heard the term it's negative data, meaning that traditionally when we did these things, if we, say, removed an item from a cart, the current state of the cart doesn't show that item in the cart anymore, but it's not, you know, the data's gone. We, you know, we updated the state of the cart and it's gone. Well, we're moving into this new era of data science, right? And data scientists love this kind of stuff, where they can analyze why didn't this item get purchased? Why do people keep putting it into the cart and taking it back out? That's, you know, data now that we we're capturing. So next, ha what happens, though, is that these events, they're, you know, they're persisted. It's like typically you have some kind of event store. Cassandra is a real good, one, good database for this, for example. It doesn't have to be Cassandra, but it's a, it's a good example because it's just a key value. But then the events somehow need to go over to what's called the read side. And the read side is a, 
is a data store that's set up for querying. So often this is a data store that is not in, you know, um, in, in, um, fully normalized. It's more that the data is being stored for querying. Right? So one side is, is really just for capturing events, the right side. The other side is for, for querying. So we'll be going through this a lot. So in the, say we want to do a query. We want to get the current state of the order, for example. What's, you know, or maybe say the question is, uh, what's, what orders has this customer placed? Well, those kinds of queries are queries that this service should provide as part of the API of the service. So those queries are, are done on the read side. So the request comes in to do a query. It's kind of a read-only command. That command triggers some kind of a query. We do the query against the, this other data store, which can be a relational database. It could be Elasticsearch. It could be both. You, you know, I think, as you'll see, uh, you have a lot of flexibility here in the, the way you actually store the data for querying because of the way that all this stuff works and the mechanics of it. But basically, you're getting back um, you know, whatever results. And it, so it's kind of like when you're defining the microservice you're also defining what query should this microservice provide, and then design the database to support those kinds of queries, the read side database. So there's th this right side, which again is just a, like a really fast, simple key value store. And then the read side, which is go nuts, you know, whatever is the best data store for doing the queries that this service needs to provide. So moving on. That was a quick overview, but moving on, um, kind of from the design phase, there's, um, th with domain-driven design, um, if you haven't heard of it before, it's one of the, a very common way for people to identify what microservices should I build. You know, you, you, it's a design process where kind of one of the outcomes is um, a list of your microservices. I'm no do domain-driven design person. I'm, I'm a developer, so I'm kind of usually on the receiving end of these design efforts, but... Um, that's the idea. Another one, though, that's really interesting is event storming. And event storming kind of complements domain-driven design, but the idea with event storming is that you get the, the dev team involved, you get the business people involved, you get everybody and put them in a room for a day or two or three or whatever, and all they think about are what are the events that flow through the system. And they're usually doing it on some kind of sticky, you know, sticky notes on the board. And, and the notes kind of gravitate towards each other where it's like, he, these are all the events, say, related to order. Here's all the events related to shipping. Here's all the events related to uh, catalog, you know, whatever. You know, whatever kind of flow is in the system. The nice thing is that the outcome of this exercise should produce, like, a, a good idea of what microservices are really there and, you know, what, what opportunities for microservices are there in, in the system, as well as a pretty good idea of what are the commands and events that flow through this whole system which I think leads very, very nicely into an implementation <laughs> that's using event sourcing in CQRS. Because when you're implementing uh, services using event sourcing in CQRS, um, you're, you're, your head's kind of in the event game anyway. So you, it's kind of coming out of design into building the, the services with, with this whole kind of event mindset. So another reason, reduce service coupling. <laughs> And here, it's, um, the idea is that, say we have three services. And I'm going to go run through a couple scenarios. So say service one uh, needs to retrieve some information from service two. And you know, so it's like, OK, well, we'll just do an HTTP REST, right? Do a get, pull some infor from information from service two, get it back, everything's good. Real easy to implement. But the, the thing is, is like, um, what happens when service two goes down? Well, this, this is a form of coupling. When service two goes down, that might effectively take service one down. So the blast area of a, one service going out could drag down other services, which isn't a great thing, and, and it's kind of a sign of coupling. And again, it's like it's really easy to implement just the simple, you know, you know so, uh, synchronous get and retrieve, and everything works great, but it's, it works great when everything's working, but it doesn't work very well when things start to break. And you know, you, it's a matter of how do you like your life to be when you're in production? Do you like your life to be nice and simple and no problems? Or do you like excitement and outages you know, and downtime? I don't like excitement and outages and downtime. It gets even more fun, say, when the services are kind of doing things collaborative, 
collaboratively. So for example, say service one is an order service, and service three is say, like a customer credit service. And we're gonna walk a little, through a little scenario here. So say, you know, events are coming in, you know, for an order, add item, add item, you know, shipping address, billing address, credit information, whatever, and then finally the, the, the user says, bam, I wanna submit the order. So that submit order event comes in. Well, when that happens, the order goes into like a new state. So we have a new, an order sitting there and its current state is a new order, right? Well, the customer's credit service wants to know about that. So somehow we need a message from service one to service three that, hey, we got a new order, check the credit for this customer. So some message goes over to three. Three does a credit check on the, on the customer for this order and it could do a state change. So now we have a second state change and a separate service. And then everything's cool. So the, this, the, the customer credit check is gonna either reply with, yep, order approved or order rejected, right? And that message goes back to, or response goes back to uh, service one. And then service one changes the state to uh, order approved or order rejected. So there's this interesting flow that's going on here where we have basically three transactions that have occurred. Three independent, yet happening at different times, database transactions. In our good old monolith, this was probably a single transaction. We were, you know, life was good there, life was comfortable, everything was fine, just one transaction, boom, we're done. But now, you know, somebody got this bright idea to split the whole system apart and now we're doing stuff all over the place and how do you keep all this sane? Well, this is where um, things get interesting because the question is, and there's some people here who know this, it's not if something breaks, it's when something breaks. Just, you just gotta face it, that you have to think about your system, not in the happy path, but you've implemented it, and it's like, when things break in, you know, in, in the middle of the night, how are your services going to ride that out with the, the least amount of pain and suffering for the people that are responsible for production support and the customers in the business. So where can things go wrong? Well, lots of things can go wrong here. The network could break between service one and service two. So service one now can't tell service, I'm sorry, service three that I've got new orders. Service three, to make it even worse, service three could have, say, have received some messages, hey, check the credit on these customers, but before it could do it, boom, it goes down, right? So you got to, how do you recover from that? Even more interesting, say service three did do the check, it changed the state of the customer, is trying to tell service one back what happened and the network goes down. And just to make it even more interesting, service one's got the responses back but before it could act on them, it goes down. So things are gonna break anywhere here and you gotta fill all these cracks, all these, you know, these little holes where you're gonna lose messages. Because the last thing we want is customers calling up and saying, I got this order that I placed like five days ago and it's sitting there in a new state. Why is this happening? And then you guys go in and start looking at the system and you're digging, it's like, what the heck happened? And it's like, and if, when you finally realize where your problem is, it's like, you, you, you might realize, oh wow, we got, we got some leaky messages and how are we gonna plug this hole? It's, it could be pretty, pretty nasty. So the idea is that, um, and this is on the inside. In this first diagram, you're gonna see this diagram a lot for the rest of the talk. Um, we've got the right side, and that's a transaction. You know, we're, we're writing events into the right side database. And on the read side, the idea is one approach is that you're pulling. There's, a, there's a, some kind of a reader that's pulling messages from the right side and putting them into the read side. Our intuition says, why don't we just push it? And that's a viable approach, and we'll look at that a little bit later, but the reads, this pull approach is you typically cleaner to implement and uh, as robust as any kind of push approach. So this is on the inside of a microservice, just the mechanics of a microservice handling events coming into the right side and, and getting them over to the read side. But the same can apply, the same basic pattern can apply between services that Service three, as, a, as a, an order, let's say a new order goes in and it's in a, a new order state, service three is looking at the, those events and it's pulling them over. And when it sees a new order event, it knows, oh, I've got a order that I need to check the credit on. The beauty of this is that service one is completely oblivious to who's consuming uh, data from it. You know, it's, a, it's a producer, but it's not actively pushing data out to other things. It's just a producer 
that says, yeah, if you want my data, we'll use my API or whatever and, you know, to get, get my data and do what you, whatever you want with it. The same thing can be true for the customer service sending messages back to the order service. The flow could be reversed. That service one here could be the customer service. Service three could be the order service. You know, when the credit's approved or the credit's rejected, the order service could be looking for events happening in the customer service and pulling those back. So you've really kind of broken things apart. Now, this also applies, like, you know, a lot of people say, well, yeah, well, we, but we're using Kafka. You know, Kafka's our, our message bus, and everything's great. And it's like, well, guess what? The pattern in Kafka is just the same thing. The consumer is doing this. The consumer is pulling from Kafka, and it's doing it by this offset approach, right? And I'll show you uh, another, we'll look at this, you know, like, how do you get data from the producer into Kafka as well without losing anything? But it's the fundamental approach that works here is this kind of pull approach. So even with Kafka, you're not completely off the hook for worrying about losing any data. And we'll look at this a little bit more in, in a bit. So the point here is that we're looking at um, kind of the asynchronous approach, which is what I just walked you through, one asynchronous type of an approach versus the, the typical let's do everything HTTP REST type of synchronous approach. Right? And again, it's like whenever you're looking at it, whatever approach, part of the, the process should be uh, don't just consider the happy path, consider, you know, throw rocks at it. Right? Like, you know, like, you know, the fun part, I think, is we're all together as a team and we're thinking about our service and our, our service interacting with other service. And somebody says, well, what happens when this breaks? Or what happens when that breaks? What are we going to do when these things break? You're constantly challenging yourself every single step of the way. This is where I really like this pattern because kind of what emerges from that kind of conversation is that right away you, you look at the, you know, like a, a, a synchronous type of approach and go, oh man, there's no way to recover from this. We're, we're going to lose messages. Is losing messages acceptable? If it's not, you better come up with an alternate approach. I mean, sometimes it's okay to lose messages. That's fine. But often, like in the scenario I, I showed you earlier with the order and customer, you can't afford to lose any messages, not one, not a single one. If you, I've been in that situation in production where millions and millions of messages go through and every once in a while you lose one and you're a jerk. And the business hates you and your managers are on your, on your case and it's like, you gotta get this fixed and you're going, oh my God, how am I gonna fix this thing? And that's why I, when I came across something like this, it's like, okay, here's a solution that I, I know I can make work. So moving on. Uh, another advantage is break the read versus write performance bottleneck. So what I mean by that? You know, the, Typically, in, um, with this, you know, the single database, we're always making trade-offs, right? Where um, if you optimize for reads, it comes at, at, at the expense of writes. If you optimize for writes, it comes for, at the expense of reads. It's kind of like the, the index game. How many inde indexes can I add to this database before it hurts too much, right? The, this is where another advantage is of, of this segregation is, where we split things apart. The right side is kind of really optimized for writes. It's just insert, 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 insert. There's no updates, there's no deletes, it's just inserting stuff. And like, like I said earlier, you're, you're kind of leaving, you know, a delete is like leaving behind negative data. I, you know, an event that said I removed this item from the shopping cart. It's like uh, doing a journal, uh, an accounting journal. You know, accountants don't use erasers, right? They, they have to, they enter compensating information into the journal. You can never update, you, you're, you know, you're always just adding to um, the log. On the other hand, the read side is really optimized for querying. So it's not obsessively normalized if you don't have to. It's, it's like, you might even have redundant data where, say, uh, you have the same data in two different you know, sets of tables because they're, they're there for two, set, two different types of queries, right? Which is a big no-no in our traditional world of doing things like you know, a fully normalized database. Um, and then as, but it does come at a cost because what's happening is that as, as events are being written into the write side, the read side is trying to keep up. And there can be gaps here, so that's what I'm trying to show on this, uh, this picture here, is that the right side's a little ahead of the read side. 
right? And because the, the right side is not waiting for the read side to catch up. It's just slamming events into the right side. So the, the cost here is that event, there's an eventual consistency relationship between the right side and the read side. So your instincts are going, okay, eventual consistency. That's, uh, I don't like that, right? That's kind of bad. Um, but it's, I, I'm almost kind of imploring you, don't give up on this too quickly. Push yourself. You know, think about, you know, can, you know, I can, I know there's scenarios where, say, eventual consistency isn't going to work, but you know, it's often necessity is the mother of invention. Push yourself to really think, do you, can you really come up with a solution where this will work? Because the, the payoff is what I'm trying to show you. Things like you know, higher performance, better, you know, less, less coupling, better messaging, things like that. So you know, a lot of people go, oh, well, you know, we can't do the eventual consistency thing. But just give it a shot. Push it as hard as you can before you give up. Because another advantage is, what I wanted to show is another reason is elevate the concurrency barrier. And what I mean by this is that, you know, the, the traffic that our systems take, you know, I know it varies all over the board, but, you know, it's like some systems I worked on in the past, you know, you had the morning peak and the afternoon peak and, and things were kind of busy during the week and then the weekends were kind of slow. Um, so, you know, you had varying traffic, you know, say by the days of the week, maybe the weekend's real busy, but the week's kind of slow or the ver reverse, whatever. The fun ones are these seasonal spikes. You know, the infamous seasonal spikes like Black Friday, Cyber Monday, um, Singles Day in China, which, you know, it's beyond anything in Black Friday or, or, or uh, Cyber Monday, where the, the number of trans the, uh, online purchases that happened in China, I guess, on Singles Day, which I, which I think is somewhere in February, is way beyond uh, what's, what's happening ever, ever else in the world. Uh, but the fun part, you know, I mean, and you often read about in the, in the, uh, uh, in the news about different online sites that cratered because they had these spikes and the system just couldn't take it. And I feel, you know, I feel the pain for the people that are responsible for those systems because can you imagine being on the team of the system that crashed on a big shopping day and you couldn't take all those orders, and your, your businesses and manager, no, I don't even want to be there. So the, the challenge, though, is that often the, the ceiling, you know, how far can you go before you run out of gas, it's not always this, but often, in my experience, it's been the database. You can only push the database so hard, and it pushes back. So like you get the daily load, and you kind of go into this yellow territory, and things start to slow down. And, when, and what I'm trying to show when you get in the red territory, territory, the database really gets mad at you, and it, it really s slows things down. So if your system is kind of dancing with, the, you know, poking at the ceiling, it's not a great place to be. But it's also not necessarily an easy problem to solve with the traditional way we've been doing things with databases and so on. And these spikes are the real fun ones. And that, this graph I'm trying to show this is that you get into the yellow zone and you kind of plateau on the throughput of your database, you get in the red zone, is, and this is where it starts to nosedive, where your database response times get really mad at you. It used to be five milliseconds or three milliseconds to do an insert, and now it's taking 150 milliseconds to do an insert. And it's like, and now, now you're in a world of hurt. So this is where that right side reads side. You get a big spike in traffic, the right side goes, no problem. You know, because all I'm doing is inserts. It's simple key value, no, you know, no multi-table updates, no you know, big uh, uh, transactions, just slamming data into the, into the right side. And the read side, just as fast as it can, is struggling to keep up. But the balancing game between trying to keep the read side as close to the right side, you have more options. Like m maybe you have a lot more readers reading from the, um, the, reads, the, the read side readers reading from the right side. There's all kinds of different strategies that you can use. But again, you have to be aware that when you go with this approach, you have the eventual consistency to consider. But if it works for you, then that consistency ceiling goes way up, or, or the concurrency ceiling goes way up. You can push a lot through, more through your system without running into that, like that database brick, brick ceiling. So this is where things, back into messaging, simplify and harden messaging. With messaging, when you're building a distributed system, and you have messaging going on between services, you should think of every single message that goes between the services, and you, you should categorize it in one of these three ways. At most once, at least once, or exactly once. Everybody wants exactly once. It's like, I want every message to go exactly once. 
good luck. Right? It's not easy to do, uh, but the at most ones is the, uh, the, 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 the easier one to implement and one that's most often implemented. But the, I like to kind of think of this as um, at least once as maybe once, meaning that most messages will make it, some will not, right? That's a fact of life. Some messages won't make it. So if you go with it and at least uh, at most once approach, you're saying, if I lose some messages, that's OK. And there are plenty of scenarios where that's just fine, OK? The uh, at, most, or at least once is, I like to think of it as once or more, that because it's like you're going to get every message, guaranteed. You're not going to lose any messages. But the cost is you might get the same message more than once. So the receiver needs to be able to deal with that. Oh, I saw this message. I can, I can ignore it. It's going to happen. So you're, again, the receiver code has to, has to deal with that. The exactly ones is, um, is essentially, I kind of think of it as essentially was. There's uh, tricks that you can do to make it look like a message is exactly once, but it's difficult. Um, and you know, things like if you're doing that offset pull, like the, you know, the, which is kind of the Kafka model of pulling messages from, you know, from the topic, um, the idea is there, you can get a form of exactly once in a couple different ways. One is that you're storing the offset in the same transaction that you're storing the change that, that the message made, OK? But if you, so you in a way effect, have effectively once, that you, you know, the message only will get processed one time because they're both offset and data stored in the same transaction. Um, Another one is that you, um, there's, you have some kind of intelligent filtering to dedupe messages. If it sees a, you know, it knows how to look at each message. If it saw it before, it goes, oh, I saw this message. I can ignore it. So you, you kind of have a, a essentially once. So I mentioned earlier that we'll look at kind of a push approach. And our, again, our intuition kind of pushes us in this direction where the, uh, where, you know, I have, a service, it, it produced some data. Well, by golly, it's my responsibility to make sure that data gets out to whoever needs it, right? So, but the, the challenge here is that you can't just post it somewhere and say, all right, that's probably going to make it. And it's, you're right, it's probably maybe going to make it. It might, and it, it's going to have situations where it's not going to make it. Because if you don't do anything to make sure that it makes it, then you're going to lose messages. So this, you know, the idea is you have some kind of retry logic. But you've got to throw rocks at this as well. The retry logic has to survive that service going down when it has messages that haven't been delivered yet. So the, the, the litmus test would be, all right, we set up our retry logic. It just failed. When we come back up, are all the messages that need to be sent, are they going to get sent? If the answer is yes, then you got a good um, approach. You're not going to lose any messages. But when you really closely look at it, you might find that you, you, you the hunt is to find the holes. Are you going to lose messages? This is the one that scares me the most. Because you know, people get Kafka, and it's like, OK, great. I mean, once you get that data into Kafka, you're good. The data is going to get there. Because guess what? The consumers are pulling from it. But the situation is, is the producer, the producers say, you know, it's a service. Maybe it stores some data in a database, commits that transaction. And it makes a call to Kafka, everything's cool, right? Throw a rock at that. What's wrong with that picture? And the gap there, the leak, is that the transaction happened, but before you could call Kafka, boom, you go down. And it could be Kafka's not down, it's just the network's down between your service and Kafka, right? And what do you do? You, you're, you've lost the message, right? And it's like, and it's what, the, the reason it scares me is like you go into production, everything's working, and every, but all of a sudden you start hearing from customer complaints and business complaints. Says, hey, you, this is this problem's happening. We got orders that are stuck in a new state; they're not moving. It's like, and then you start looking. It's like, well, what, you know, what's wrong? You know, and you dig and dig and dig, and ultimately you're going to find that you're doing this: that you have the database transaction, and then you're making a separate call to Kafka, and. If you had those failures where you've lost some messages, that's a really subtle thing, and it, it scares me. The solution, this is why uh, even trying to get data from, say, from your service into Kafka, if it's, you've persisted, you know, the, uh, 
the event, or you, even if you've updated your database, you know, say you have a service that's not using event sourcing in CQRS, you still have to have some approach that makes sure that you're getting that message into Kafka and it can retry if it fails, right? This is why, again, I like this, this reader type of pull thing. There's a reader pulling, things, pulling the events from the event log and pushing them into Kafka. And you, and you get the at least once pull approach. Make, so every, you, know, you, you will not lose any messages getting them into Kafka. And once Kafka has it, then you've got the at least once pull all the way down through the whole um, flow. And it doesn't matter who's consuming. And, and like I'm showing here, it's, the, uh, you know, it, it's important to think about this and just trying to make that, you know, that simple call to Kafka itself. And then this, almost there, but the, this one here is eliminate service coupling. This one I like the most. So here's a scenario. Say we have a bunch of services, and I put customer service in the middle. So say all these other services, in order for them to do their work, they need some customer information. So whenever they, you know, they're, they're performing some uh, action, they just do a get to retrieve some information from customer. The, you know, the response goes back and everything's fine, right? Piece of cake, real simple. Well, this is again, what will go wrong, right? And what happens when customer goes down? When customer goes down, the blast area isn't just customer, it's all these services that are coupled to it, right? So you get this you know, big kind of blast area in, in your system where a bunch of services have collapsed because one service is misbehaving. And this is another form of coupling, right? Well, guess what? what how can we fix this? Well, a, a possible solution here, bear with me because this is, gets a little crazy, but um, customer is just creating events, writing, you know, just doing event sourcing at CQRS like any other service. These other services are consuming from customer. And this is the heresy. It, those services are storing their own view of customer in their own internal database in their service. Okay. The so part of our you know our natural response to this is like, well, oh my God, we're re first we're replicating data, we're duplicating data. All these are dirty words, right? But it's like no, they're not anymore because storage you know is getting really really cheap, um, and. You know, what do you want? Do you want a distributed system that works, that can take a hit and the system keeps running? Or do you want an economical distributed system that is, uh, you, you've trade, made trade-offs where it's more brittle? If you don't want those brittle services where one service takes down a bunch of services, then this is an approach. Because now in this scenario, when customer goes down, the other services aren't even aware of it because they don't care. They can keep doing their thing, you know, requests are coming in, They've got their own view of customer that you know, works for them, and they just keep right on conducting their business. When customer comes back up, um, we just resume pulling data from customer. I've, this is relatively new, but I just ran into somebody, in fact, it was last week, I, he works at a company that they had like two or 300 microservices, quite a bit. But they, they've kind of gone all in on microservices. They've been doing it for, for a number of years now. This is the basic pattern that they've established. Is like This is the rule for everybody implementing microservices in the company. This kind of basic pattern where um, if you need data, don't depend on somebody else. Make yourself as independent and loosely coupled as possible, every single service. And so this is, I was delighted because this is like one of the first people that I've talked about or talked to that had done it on, on this scale, where they just really kind of just, over time, this was done through uh, battle scars and, and uh, experience, right? That they, they kind of evolved into this pattern. But again, it's like, what are you, nuts? We're replicating data, things like that. But the key thing here is that because of the messaging, you know, it, where you've got like an at least once messaging approach that you're, every message is guaranteed to make it eventually, it opens up these options for doing stuff like this. And the end result is that you've got systems where they can compensate for, you know, one service goes down, the rest of the system goes, I don't care, we're still running, the customers don't even know it, the business doesn't even know it, the, you know, 
And it, it, now it, in, it increases the flexibility of being, say, a little bit more adventurous. Maybe you make a release of a new service, like say you and I are on the team for customer, we release customer, and customer breaks because some change we made broke in production, which is like, oh my god, you know, it's, you, you don't want all things to happen. But now the fear is kind of reduced because, I mean, you don't want this to happen, but if it happens, you're not taking down the whole system. And the other way, where the services are more tightly coupled with each other, if we, re you know, say you and I release customer, and our customer service goes down, and takes a whole bunch of other services down with us, that's not a good place to be. You know, so you can become a little bit more fearless with this kind of a uh, system. So the final one is graduate from the IT nursery. This one, um, it's a little indirect from what we've been talking about, but the, I, I spent a lot of time in a large enterprise in IT. And one of the things that drove me crazy was governance. And the reason being, you know, it's like, I want, to I want to change the table. I want a database. I want a server. I want a topic in a, in a, in a Kafka or something like that. And you got to go beg for it. You know, you can't have it until you fill out this form. OK, fill out the form. Yeah, answer all the questions. All right, we'll, l we'll let you know. Tick tock, tick tock, you know, hours go by, days go by. And then eventually you, you hear and it's like, oh, yeah, no, you can't have this because blah, 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 right? You, we need to talk about it. OK, let's talk about it. Why do you really need this? Blah, you know, so on and on and on. In the meantime, I, you know, I'm looking and it's like, I've been in meetings where there's been 20 people in the meeting talking about doing something, where it's like, you know, it's, it's like when I look at these kind of approaches, it's like, wait a minute, if it's my service and I own the data and it's my responsibility to make sure the service works in production, and in addition to that, if my service goes down, the other services aren't tightly coupled to me, why do I need all this, you know, nursery guidance? Why do I, you know, why do I have to beg for permission to do things? The result is that all that friction, all the things that slowed me down in the past should go away. I think. So you reduce the governance. This is horrifying to enterprises. But it's something I think you got to get over because the argument is if you reduce the order, you introduce chaos, right? But my response is like, this is organized chaos, right? If I, if, again, if I break my service, you would say you and I are working on a service and we break it, it's our responsibility to fix it. But again, we're loosely coupled as much as we, we've tried to make it as loosely coupled as possible. What's the damage, right? I'll fix it. You know, we can fix this really quick because we own it. We don't have to ask anybody to change a table or you know, whatever we made the mistake on. We just fix it and put it out and you know, put it in, back into production. So in a way, it's like, to me, it's like an organized result, revolt in a way that the, we, we, you know, organizations simply can't afford to have all this friction anymore. They, you know, I mean, I, I know the governance was put in place not to be mean or nasty. It was to try and keep us out of trouble. But the way I, I like to look, this is like 180 degree change. We still keep out of trouble because we're following these principles of, say, building services that are loosely coupled, where you own your own data, all these types of, all these things that I've been talking about. And as a result, you should have a really streamlined, fast, efficient organization with not a lot of ceremony and ritual to get things done. So finally, I, as I was doing, preparing this talk, um, I saw this quote, right? People are very open-minded about new things as long as they're exactly like the old ones. And um, we just can't afford to be this way anymore, right? Um, the, you know, I've had, when I, I'm a, as you can tell, I'm kind of a big fan of event sourcing and CQRS. And even in Lightbin, I've had a lot of interesting discussions about it. Like, well, you know, wait a minute, dude, you gotta, you gotta calm that down because it's like, it doesn't fit anywhere. Oh yeah, I know it doesn't fit anywhere, but it, you, know, you wanna make an informed, educated decision about where it fits and where it doesn't fit, right? Not just dismiss it as like, oh, this is too radical. But the challenge is that when you, like you know, I said in the beginning, it's like it showed you know, the split where the lava starts boiling up. When you start talking about event sourcing and CQRS and microservices, and microservices that own their own data and own their own schema, and people start looking at you like you just, you know, you've lost your mind you, because it's totally different than what we've been doing before. So 
they hear about microservices at first, and it's like, well, that, that, that really sounds good, but then you start digging into it. Wait a minute. This is way too different. I didn't, you know, I didn't sign up for all these changes. It's like, look, you guys, you've, you've got to get familiar with um, the, the, these types of new things. You just can't afford to uh, just sit back. And, uh, and even like the, I mentioned with the eventual consistency, that's another hard, hard one to take. But again, it's like, don't give up on it right away. Push it as hard as you can until it hurts. And if it doesn't fit, then back off. But more often than not, if you, people are pushing these things, and the reward is that, like this one company I was talking to, this is their pattern. They pushed themselves, as, you know, they kept pushing themselves, and now they have this pattern of a, of a system that can evolve for the business at a really, really high rate. All right, the business can say, I want this new feature or something, and now you can, that's the ultimate goal, is to be able to let the business go as quickly as possible without getting yourself all, you know, uh, screwed up in trying to roll things out in production. So that's basically it, the, the, the seven reasons. Uh, you know, the smooth, you know, kind of from the main driven design, um, I, I hit on service coupling, you know, messaging between services, you know, kind of multiple times. And I, so that was kind of one theme of the talk. And the other one was the, um, the impact on, on the uh, performance and the dynamics of the data itself, you know, like the, uh, the, the, uh, the read-write performance, the concurrency, and so on, things like that. And then the final one was the kind of call to rebellion on uh, governance a little bit. You know, like push, if you're in an IT organization, if you're not, you know, you're great. But if, you know, if you're in a, a big IT organization, um, one of the things that I think you can start to chip away with when you start to move to these kinds of te technologies are those processes that just slow you down uh, and don't keep you out of trouble uh, in, in, in this kind of new environment. And that's all I got. And just... <laughs> We've got plenty of time for some questions. If you... um, first of all, thank you. Great talk. I have a couple of questions if I may. Um, one, when you talk about eventual consistency, I wonder if you have patterns for like basic levels of consistency. For example, read your own rights. Uh, and like a new example, when you remove an item from shopping cart, I think it would be terrible to me, uh, for me to hit a five and s see it again in my shopping cart back. And the second question is, uh, you didn't mention dead letter messages or events. I'm sure you've dealt with them. I'm curious what your thoughts are. So yeah, with the with the eventual consistency part. I mean, for one thing is that you can ask the entity for its state. That's a simple query that the right side can give you. Like, what's the current state of my entity? Right, so like, what does my shopping cart look like right now? The, the, the authoritative source of the current state of the entity is always gonna be the right side. So, the, um, so if you need that, what is it right now, you know, and you're not doing any kind of fancy query, like what are the orders that this customer's done over time, then you, you have that option. So you don't always have to query the read side to get the, the state of the entity. But it's, it is limited in, in the queries that you can do against. It's really just like, what's the current state of the entity? Um, the, and then again, the read side is really, all, you always have to be uh, aware of the fact that you're, you might not be seeing exactly the current state. And so you, you have to take that into consideration when you're doing your queries. I, one thing I did hear about, though, is that uh, one company um, mentioned that they did something where they still wanted to do the query, but the query actually triggered making sure that any uh, pending changes for that entity that were still on the right side that hadn't been seen on the read side, they would pull them over in the course of the query. I don't know exactly how they did it, but that was the technique that I heard them mention was they, they kind of caused a flush. And well, then it they could be done based on the timestamp or version number. Yeah, like, something like that. At least this version. It sounded a little complicated, but it was like, okay, they, they made it work, right? So um, th that was kind of pushing the eventual consistency, I, I thought, as an example there. Um, and on the dead letter, um, th this is where a message was intended to be sent somewhere, but it, the, the recipient's no longer there? Or? Oh, the recipients are consistently failing to process. There is the bug. Uh, they cannot deserialize message. So there is no oh, way they will okay. ever process. Oh, uh, okay. Like a poison message. Yeah, poison right? message. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. 
and the it's like at all costs, and that's something you re I think you really have to test for that that you your receiver can never get into that blowing up when it gets a message. That there's got to be the like the ultimate catch, you know, try catch type of thing where a, a really bad message comes in and it can't um, take the service down. It I I. I We've had this discussion in, in various times in the past where that's been a concern because it's happened in the past. I consider that to be a bug in the system. And I know it's, it's like, okay, yeah, fine, you call it a bug, but we're in production and we're down, right? But it's like, you gotta really think about that when you're setting up the service. You, you know, like in your testing, you should try and think of every nasty thing that you can do to the receiver. What, what's the worst possible message we could send to the receiver? Make sure that the receiver can handle it, right? and deal with it appropriately. Uh, now, again, it's, you've got a message that you can't understand. The receiver's gotten a message that it can't understand. So in a way, that's, that's some kind of a, a bug. The, the, even there, though, the challenge is that, what do you do with it now? Right? So some people, oh, we'll just throw it into an error queue. So you throw it into an error queue or an error, what, error file, whatever, error table, and nobody ever looks at them. Right? So, you got to, uh, it's, it's a difficult problem. They, ultimately, um, the, the goal is to try and keep things as simple as possible, I think. I, I know that's not, not always achievable as well, but first off, it's always be, you know, be resilient in terms of the consumer can take pretty much any garbage in and still be able to say, all right, I don't understand what this message is, but I, I and this is what I'm going to do with it. Log it, throw it into uh, some kind of a queue or something like that, and then move on, you know because you, you don't want it to stop just because it got a poison message. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, let's suppose your right side is a Kafka topic. Uh, what about a retention policy? Uh, is the canonical approach to uh, keep uh, messages in perpetuity? Or what, and how do you uh, think about replay? The that's a real good question, because um, typically Kafka you know, has a, a limited lifespan where messages stay in like a week or two weeks or something like that. The, the, when people talk about event sourcing and CQRS, they often say, you know, the idea is that you never delete events. And then, of course, the pushback is, that, wow, you know, our data is going to explode. And it could, but it really depends. Like if you have, say, bank accounts, a bank account has a history that goes on forever, right? So you could have hundreds and you know, p potentially thousands of events, say, to give you what the current balance is. On the other hand, say you have an order, and an order has a relatively finite number of events before it's done and it never be changed again. So it really depends on the kind of data you know, and, and retention uh, as well. Um, I'm not a, I'm more of a, I'm not a purist, I, I, I think. I'd rather take the approach where you look at each case. And if it's OK to only keep the data for a certain amount of time and it's gone, then fine, get rid of it. Because Cassandra could do the same thing. It could age out old stuff after a certain amount of time, right? So you don't just keep accumulating garbage. Um, often, the thing that drove me kind of, one of the things that drove me to this talk was the whole replay thing. Oh, yeah, well, when you're using event logs, you can recover blah, 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 because you got all the events and just replay all the events and off you go. It's like, okay, big deal, right? Now, it is nice to say you design your read side, you design your queries, and say you go with a relational database first, and that's your read side query database. But then, then say somebody comes along and says, oh, you know, we'd really like to be able to do this search where we can um, do more of like an elastic search kind of a query. Right? So you'd like to add an Elasticsearch database alongside of the relational database. So you know, some of the queries come from the relational database, some of the queries come from the Elasticsearch database. If you've got all your history, that's where the advantage comes in, because you can take all the history and load it into the Elasticsearch database. And now, you've, you know, as a new feature of your microservice, you have these new queries that are available. And again, it's all black box. On the outside, you just change your APIs. Here's some new queries that you can do that are really cool, because you can do these kind of Google-like searches, right? On the inside, you've made this you know, fairly major database you know, persistence change. If you're throwing away the data, that's not a possibility. 
it's a trade-off, right? If you, if you don't need, think you're going to have to do that, then don't worry about it. But I would say, though, that um, the natural reaction is, oh, my God, we're going to keep all the history. Isn't that going to explode you know, in the, the amount of storage? And it's like, well, think about it a bit, you know, like the orders. I've talked to people. I've asked them. It's like, has the volume of your data gone up when you've used event sourcing in secret? No, because you know, we have orders, right? There's a finite number of events. So the actual storage for, uh, say, an order in a relational database in a traditional way versus a bunch of events and, and the read site as well, it maybe it's more, but it's not like excessively more. Thanks. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I was wondering, when it comes to the trade-off between availability and consistency, is that the decision that's usually made by each microservice individually, or you need you know, those uh, rituals and ceremonies to take those uh, kind of it, decisions? It, it definitely is um, service by service. Yeah, the eventual consistency decision is, is it, will it work for this service or not? So yeah, it's not like an across the board at all. Some services okay, some services not okay. That, that type of thing. Thanks. So I think we're going to have to uh, get ready for the, the next session. So again, I really appreciate. Uh, and I, I'm a, I'll be around for the rest of the time. <laughs>